Today is Monday, June 4th, 2018. Uh, we are here at the Atlanta History Center. My name is Sue Verhoff. I'm Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. With us today is Ed Woods. Ed is a volunteer here at the Atlanta History Center and also uh, volunteers with the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business uh, Association. We're very grateful to be here today with Tracy Gordon. Uh, Tracy's very graciously agreed to be interviewed today for the Veterans History Project. Tracy's history is being collected as part of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. And we appreciate the time that you're, you're taking to come in today. Um, Tracy is a Desert Storm veteran, an Army veteran, and uh, she's agreed to come in and share her story. So to get us started, Tracy, if you can tell us your full name and your date of birth, please. Yes, ma'am. My full name, Tracy Lynn Gordon, and my date of birth, January 22nd, 1971. Okay, all right. Well, tell us a little bit about your background and growing up years. Uh, growing up, um, well, I was born premature. And so that was an awesome thing, I suppose, because I wasn't, you know, supposed to even be here. And, you know, according to the doctors at that time, you know, back in the 70s, the technology and the medicine weren't as great as it is now. But I survived, and, uh, and I believe that's what started the soldier in me, <laughs> is, uh, you know, being, first being born premature and uh, being healthy afterwards, you know, because uh, it's hard growing up, I guess, as a little kid like that. But I made it. Absolutely. You mentioned that you come from a long line of, of military members. You've got some military history. Yes. Uh, my father was in the military in the Army, and he fought in Vietnam, and my grandfather as well. So I come from a family of military. Uh, my uncle was in the Army, and then I also have a uncle who I believe was in the Navy. I have an aunt who was in the Air Force, a lieutenant. So, you know, my family has a history of uh, military coming, you know, from different wars and different experiences. Awesome. So you grew up in Florida? I grew up in Florida. Uh, my father was from New York. Um, he passed away in 1996. And my mother's still alive. And she's from Charleston, South Carolina. So, uh, yeah. And I, as a kid, though, I grew up in New York, you know, during like back and forth coming through to visit my grandmother and aunties and uncles. Um, but they relocated in Orlando, Florida. And so I was born and raised in Orlando at Orange Memorial Hospital, which is now Florida Hospital. So went to school. In and I went to school as well in Orlando and also went to college in Florida. Which college? I went to Bethune-Cookman University. Okay. Yes. What was your program of study? Uh, major in music and minor in English. And I, but, I, but I didn't finish. I joined the Army while I was in college. Well, tell us about so, that. How did that come about? Okay, um, I was on a band scholarship for a year, and you know, I did well the first fall, what, fall semester, I did well. And in the spring, you know, I kind of felt like, well, I don't know if college is gonna be, as much as I love college, I just didn't think it was gonna be the right thing for me at that time. And so I talked to a recruiter from the Marines. And that's how this career started in the Army. It started actually with going to the Marine recruiter to try to see what type of jobs they had. And back in those days, women were not allowed to fight in infantry or anything having to do with bombs, anything having to do with, uh, you know, frontline uh, tactics, flying, you know, um, even flying the bombers, you know, we weren't allowed to do any of that. So I wasn't allowed to go into the Marines because the job that I wanted, women could not, uh, weren't allowed, I'll put it that way. What job did you want? I wanted infantry in a Marine, more like Secret Service. Uh, you know, I wanted to be on that front line. I wanted to be the grunt. You know, I wanted to be in the tunnel rat. You know, I wanted to be that. And so they were like, no, you, you're a woman, you can't do this. And so they kind of, I felt discriminated at that time a little bit, you know, like, give us a chance, you know, 
Because if my male counterpart gets killed, then I'm going to have to step up and I want to know what I'm doing. But so the Marines, you know, told me, hey, we can't give you this job. So I said, you know what, I'll go to the Army. So I tried infantry in the Army, 24th Infantry. They said, no, you're a woman. So I said, you know what, I'll just get with the unit a different way. So I asked about truck driving since I already knew how to, you know, drive a pickup truck or because back then, you know, you figure I'm about 18, 19 years old trying to get in the military and they want to know what type of experience, experiences you have. And so I said, well, let me go ahead and, and try the truck driving. So I became an 88 Mike truck engineer, but a heavy equipment operator, which means I get to drive, uh, drive the Hemets, the five tons, the deuce and a halves, anything that's a earth mover, you know, jet fuel, tankers, that was me. And so I was able to get um, assigned with the unit in Desert Storm, which we'll talk about, but uh, I was able to be on the front line. How did your family feel about you going into the Army? They were, at first, they didn't even know. <laughs> but when they, because I just like up and left college and went, but when I called them from basic training, they were surprised, but then they were happy. And, uh, you know, they felt that, okay, so you left school to be in the Army, that's fine. Um, you know, uh, we hope that during your career that you finish school, you know, so because the GI Bill was in, uh, still in full effect. So, you know, I opted to do that, is to join the military and then to get my GI Bill. So they were kind of scared at first because they didn't want me to fight in a war and stuff like that, with, you know, but... Um, like I said, my dad was in the military and my uncle, my mother's brothers and sisters. So it, it was okay. They they felt okay. They was just a little nervous. Um, at that time, you figure it was 1990, and that's when Saddam Hussein started killing their, his people and his children and killing all of his generals and gassing them with the sarin, I think it was called sarin gas. So. or yeah, some type of nerve agent gas and uh, which ended up starting the, de the first desert storm okay. wow. yeah so they were nervous they were they didn't really want me they wanted me to finish college they really didn't want me to be in the military but they figured you know I'm 18 I'm grown and if that's what I want to do then go ahead and do it good you mentioned that your aunt had served in the Air Force. Was yeah, she, she still alive at that time? She's yeah. still alive now, oh. um, but she has PTSD really bad. Uh, I love her to death, and I just didn't know. I didn't think it would happen to her. Uh, she was in Desert Storm as well, and I think, but you know, by her, she was uh, the well, like an intelligence officer, so she dealt with the computers and all that stuff, very smart. And when she came home, she, I don't know, she had flashbacks and it kind of, uh, you know, kind of messed her up a little bit. But okay. But she's doing well now. Um, my cousin takes care of her. Good. So she's being taken care of. Well, tell us a little bit then. Take us through your training. Uh, you know, you enlisted. What happened okay. next? Okay. So I enlisted. Once I left college, I enlisted. And I went to... Uh, Fort Jackson. Now, during this time, I admit um, there weren't that many blacks. Okay, so in my class, you know, we had maybe, we had a few be because most girls, when they got there, they got scared and they quit. Like, as soon as you got off that bus, you know, it, it, it was, uh, they call it intake, I believe, when you get in. And, uh, these are just some of the places that we had to go. We had to go to dental, you know, they took us through that. And then they took us through our, you know, where our barracks was gonna be and stuff like that. So at first it was cool, you know. Um, if you had long hair, like I did, we had to cut it. My hair was longer than my shoulders. So you had to cut it above shoulder length. So I just, you know, chopped all my hair off, I guess. So so the Cavalier could fit. <laughs> and um, Fort Jackson was actually an all-male barrack. 
when we got there, it was co-ed. So they had just started the co-ed with the barracks. And these, these are some of the trainings that we went through. How many women were in your, your training unit? I had 50 in my platoon. So you would figure 50 to 60 girls in each platoon, and I was first squad leader. So in my platoon, I had 50 girls that I had to take care of. And then we had four squad leaders, so it was maybe two, three hundred women in one barrack or, you know, one area that they set for us. It was probably about, yeah, two, three hundred women, black and white. And Asian, you know, we had all types of ethnic people there. But not all of them graduated. You know, like I said, during what the percentage, would you percentage, say? I would say, out of my class, I would say 80% maybe graduated and the other 20% either quit or got kicked out or got hurt, you know, during training or, or, or was just scared. A lot of girls, you know, they weren't, they thought they were ready, but they really were, wasn't ready. Um, the drill sergeants were very tough, you know. We, male, male and female, and female both. male and female. Um, yes, uh, very, very tough. Um, they didn't discriminate at all. Like they didn't see us as women. They saw us as soldiers. So it, it didn't matter to them. They just wanted to teach us what we needed to know, you know, to keep us alive if we had to end up in a war. We didn't know we were going, you know, back then. We didn't, it was the furthest thing from our mind you know, was fighting a war, so. But they, they taught us everything as if we were going to the war. So. And I was just trying to find some pictures. My graduation picture. Oh, right there. And that's my graduation picture <laughs> when I graduated. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is our intake picture. Before we graduate, they do a picture of everyone. Gotcha. So that's what it was. How long were you at Fort Jackson then? I was at Fort Jackson for, what, three months, okay. eight weeks? Mm -hmm. Well, two, two months. I think it was eight and a half weeks or something like that. Okay. And the Marines was 13 weeks, so that was another reason why I changed from the Marines to the Army is that their basic training was a lot less than, you know, 13 hard weeks at uh, Paris Island. <laughs> so, yeah. Fort Jackson was bad. Yeah, time. I was like, okay, I think I'll go to Fort Jackson with eight weeks. <laughs> so and then what? So after that, um, after graduation, we all went to our AIT school, which is our um, training, our job training. And I did mine at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, in Rolla, Missouri, which is, I believe, outside of East St. Louis, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's right outside. It's like an hour maybe away from East St. Louis. And what and, does AIT stand for, for those that um, I believe it. That's a good question, because, you know, I went on. See, AIT, that's a good Let me see. Um, Army intelligence training. That's okay. what, I, at least that's what I thought it was. Okay. All right. AIT, Army intelligence training. Works for me. Um, <laughs> I hope that's what it means. <laughs> but if not, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it was very cold in Missouri, yes. It was very cold. When I went there, it was uh, winter time. So for another maybe couple of months, another yeah, I think it took another couple of months for us to graduate from there. So um, we were in Missouri for a, a while. I mean, it was a very good learning experience for me. Um, I had just learned how to drive a truck, a stick shift. And so I, they actually taught me how to drive the big trucks in, in the uh, eight speeds and the 16 gears and the you know, all the different gears and stuff. So that was kind of cool, gotcha. I thought. Awesome. And um, other than it being cold, 
uh, we did a lot of uh, what, what I call bivouac, which is um, hiking mm -hmm. um, with our rucksacks, our weapons, our M16s. And we went out in the actual woods and we, um, what we call zero our weapons, where we have to go out on the range and we have to sort of get our weapons trained to the right, you know, uh, basically. I got, I got to use advanced individual training. Advanced individual training. Yeah, advanced individual Thanks, training. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed I you've close. got the sharpshooter medal. Did you get that yes. in Missouri? I got around? that in Missouri. Okay. Yes, I did. Well done. And I still, to this day, on for the record, I shot an expert. They cheated me one shot, which was the 300, I think. I always say that and they laugh, but <laughs> they gave me sharpshooter, but they said I missed it by one. And I said, no way, there's no way. I should be an expert shooter, but okay, I'll take sharpshooter. And then what happened after Missouri? Where did you go? After Missouri, they took us to, um, that's when things started getting weird because our orders were set after training, advanced training. Our um, orders were set to go to Frankfurt, Germany. Okay. And then that's when I believe Saddam started doing all the wild and crazy things. And the talk came up with George Bush Sr., uh, President Bush Sr., that he would uh, fight Saddam, but it was just a rumor. But it had came back to us in Missouri that it ain't no rumor. Mm -hmm. So they were just saying that on TV, it's a rumor, but to us, we were getting orders, hey, we, we, we need to go fight. And so y'all need to be ready and you need to get your plans together if you gotta call your parents. If you have kids, you know, because some of the teenagers, you know, were parents as well. Yeah. And they would go to the army to try to help take care of them. So right. it was kind of hard because we had our hopes set on doing one thing. And then here comes this guy, just evil, just evilness at its best, I guess. And he, we had to stop him. I put it that way. I agree with. President Bush is, he needed to be stopped. Um, the way he was, uh, he was like a dictator. He was like uh, Hitler. He, he would kill you at the drop of a dime. I mean, it was terrible over there, you know. And they trained their children as well to kill us. So it, it was kind of hard to sit there and see a child holding a AK-47 and you, it's either him or you and, you know. So when did you find out that you weren't going to Frankfurt? When I found out, so it was a long trip. So after graduation in Fort Leonard Wood, they shipped us to Fort Sheridan in Chicago. And so we thought we were gonna be there. You know, we thought, okay, maybe we'll just get stationed here in Chicago. Um, but no, they changed the orders again to go to uh, Sparta, Wisconsin, I believe, Fort McCoy. And once we got to Fort McCoy, that's when we knew for sure that we weren't coming home. We, we went straight from Fort McCoy to get our uh, G shots and get our overseas shots. That's when they processed us to get ready to ship out to Saudi Arabia. So that's really when we found out. We didn't even know until when we got to Fort McCoy gotcha. that we were on our way to Saudi Arabia. How'd you feel about that? I ain't want to go. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. I, at first, I was like, no, I want to go home for Christmas and see my mom because you figure this is, what, Christmas Eve? And Christmas Eve, t what, 19... What was it? Christmas Eve, 1990? 90, I think, yeah. Yes, yep. Christmas Eve, 1990. I'm on, my ph on the phone, and I told my mom and my dad I wasn't coming home. I had to go to to the war. And I cried and I cried and I cried. I was so hurt. It was, but there was nothing we could do because if you didn't go, you were going to Fort Leonard Wood to, uh, I mean Fort Leavenworth in Kansas to prison. 
So I was was not going to get locked up <laughs> for not going somewhere. So, I, I, you know, a lot of people did. A lot of people end up going to Fort Lend uh, Leavenworth. They, believe it or not, uh, they were scared and they chose to go to jail and be disgraced as a soldier than to fight. So I said, no, nah, I'm a fighter, you know. I just didn't want to go right then because it was Christmas and I felt I should at least get a chance to go home and see my parents. So if I pass away, I can say, okay, I'm, I'm good. I saw my mom and them, you know. And uh, I think that's really what, I wasn't really, I, I, how should I say it? I didn't know what to say or do. I, I just, like I said, I just cried and cried and then I called my mama. And she cried and, uh, you know, it was like, oh, but you got to go and I love you. I'll pray for you. And so that's what happened. And after that, uh, we partied at Fort McCoy. <laughs> we had a good old boy party and we just, for real, had a good time for Christmas. And because we knew it might be the last time we have. So tell us what happened next. So uh, after we left Fort McCoy, it was, a, I believe, 18-hour trip on the plane. Uh, we had two flights. We had a flight from LaGuardia. So in other words, we flew from, I believe, Fort McCoy to LaGuardia Airport, New York. And we got on the plane. We went to Germany. And then we got on a C-130. And we took the C-130 because we had to get our trucks and equipment. You know, we were supply. And once we got all that on the plane, we got on the C-130, and that was one of the longest uh, plane trips I've ever taken. And that was from Frankfurt to? From, well, from America from, okay. to Germany, and then we laid over in Germany gotcha. for an hour, whatever it was, and then from Germany to, um, I believe it was Daharan Airport, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And okay. that's where we uh, we we landed in Dahran. And you're traveling as a unit, yes, right? Yes, we okay. traveled as a unit. So you're talking about, because the C-130 holds hundreds of us. So you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of us on the plane, plus our equipment and um, rifles, pretty much everything, jet fuel. You know, we we were... I think someone said we were like sitting ducks because if they had attacked us, you know, I know like in Vietnam they had uh, uh, RPGs or whatever they called them and from the land, artillery. And so that's what we were kind of worried about was uh, what if we get fired on, we, we have no way of, um, we have no way of protecting ourselves rather. But we, we, uh, we made it safely. What were your thoughts when you landed in Saudi Arabia? What were you thinking? Um, well, I know when we was over, when we f were flying from Germany, um, I remember looking down out of the airplane window and thinking, oh my God, there's water everywhere. And it was actually the Red Sea, the actual Red Sea that God parted for Moses. And we all thought that was so cool. and. You know, we were like, okay, we're going to make it here safe. We're going to make it safe. Nobody's going to hit us out the sky and all that because we just rolled up. You know, we just flew over the Red Sea. We're going to be protected because God is with us. You know, we're just psyching ourselves up, you know. And uh, so when we hit the airport, you know, it was new land. It was kind of weird for me because uh, I guess the heat, it was 130 degrees. And we got on all this stuff, and, and I'm thinking, I'm going to die in this stuff. <laughs> I ain't got to wait for them to shoot me because I'm about to suffocate. Like, we got to come, like, we're coming out all our rucksacks and, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, like, everybody's coming out of their clothes. For real, we were hot. It was 130 degrees over there. Um, but when we got there, we knew we had a job to do, and... Um, you know, we all got our units together and once we got our trucks off of the C-130, we went straight to our mission. It wasn't no, uh, you know, 
lollygag and hang around talking. No, we got in them trucks. We headed out to the desert. And what was your mission at that point? The mission at the time was to help relieve some of the guys that were already there. So we were kind of their relief. And the first place we went to was um, King Khalid Military City, which is like in like in the desert, like 20 miles deep inside the desert. Um, we set up our tent and we um, basically what our job was to was to help the 24th Infantry. We were helping the uh, tank units, the 101 Airborne, the 24th Infantry, the um, M1A1. So we we had the trailers on the back of our trucks. So in other words, you had trucks with the tanks for the fuel. You had trucks with the supplies, and then we had the trucks for um, basically everything, you know, food, water, uh, you name it. And so our job was to keep everybody flourished with clothes and food and ammunition and guns if they didn't have a weapon, you know, basically supply for them. But we ended up on the front lines with them. Um, I guess that we had no choice, you know, they needed stuff so we had to bring it up there. So yes, we get, we got to see, we got fired upon, yes, you know, we got to see tracers, I guess you would call that tracers, the bullets and stuff, but um, King Khalid Military City is where we set up our base which was Log Base Bravo, um, where I was stationed at. So we stayed out there for months, and it was cold. I never knew a desert could get cold the way that did, but it was freezing. I'm talking about zero degrees in the desert during the winter. So you went from the military city out to supply the units? Out to supply the units that were in the desert. Gotcha. So wherever they were, Baghdad, Bahrain, um, Iraq, Iran, because you figure Saudi Arabia's here and then you got Iraq and then you got Iran. So we traveled across the border a lot, back and forth. Saudi Arabia was just in the rear for us to somewhere where you're safe, well supposedly safe, but in the front was Baghdad, Iraq, and Iran. So we ended up traveling through all three to wherever what unit needed what, you know, just depend on who needed what and then they would call us to go and, and and try to get the, so say like if the enemy bombed one of our tanks or you know one of our guys got killed or something like that, we would be the ones to go out and get the uh, vehicle okay. or, or try to see if we, because they tried to salvage as much of the tanks as they could even though they were destroyed, you know, so we'd hook them on the back of our trucks and take them back and ship them back to America. Okay. Mm -hmm at the Port of Damam is where all of the uh, blow, you know, blown up tanks and whatnot would be put. So we couldn't get them all, but the ones that we could get, we would strap back on the ships. I believe it was USS Virginia that um, back then, because I believe Virginia is now retired, the ship. But I believe that was one of them. Okay. How long were you at the at, the, at that location? Um, I moved around a lot. So, the, talking about King Khalid or Port of Damam? King Khalid. Um, in King Khalid Military City, we were there for at least a couple months. Okay. And um, then they moved us to Kobar Towers back in Saudi Arabia. And we would work at the Port of Damam. So, it was like once we were in the desert, um, well, we were supposed to stay there longer. But what happened was there was an accident in one of the tents. Um, we thought we had came under enemy fire and found out that it was friendly fire. Um, it was during the winter time and you know, we had, the, we had the kerosene heaters. Well, one of the guys in tent C, I think I was in tent A, then we had, we had three tents, A, B, and C. I was in tent A and tent C went up in flames with everybody still in it. And 
we thought it was enemy, but we found out one of the guys fell asleep and knocked it over or something. And so, of course, you know, everybody has their weapons and their magazines, uh, banana clips. And so it's, everything just ignited almost like a firework. You just had stuff blowing up and popping. So not everybody died. That was, you know, it was rough because we lost a lot of our unit, but some people were able to get out. And that's how we found out what it was because we thought it was enemy fire. But then the, the survivors came and told us the truth that it was someone, um, you know, he uh, just careless and made a mistake and it cost, cost a lot of people lives. And so shortly after that, that's when we moved from there and moved back in the rear. But we always did our convoys. We did at least 100 trucks, either 100 to 200 trucks, a convoy, if you can imagine that line. What was that like? To look at it, it was amazing. Like uh, something you'd see in a movie. Like you couldn't, you know how you see stuff on, on TV and you see a convoy? Just imagine double that and these big trucks, 52 footers, just trucking it. I mean, we're doing at least 80 down the highway. I mean, we're foot to the ground, you know, we're gone. And all you see is these big trucks and they're not gonna stop. We, our orders were to keep going. So if you got in our way, you just would, you know, you got ran over pretty much. And uh, that experience was uh, kind of scary because we had the enemy suicide bombers and one convoy we had, I got to witness a suicide bomber who he rode, I saw him ride past my truck, but I, you know, we didn't think nothing of it. We were in a two lane. So you got one lane going this way, the other lane coming this way. So my truck and the other guys are going this way his truck's coming this way. He was speeding. I remember thinking, God, he's going so fast, you know. And because uh, he was in a regular white box truck. Well, shortly after he passed my truck, uh, shortly after he passed my truck, uh, he killed one of my friends. And, uh, I'm gonna be tough. He killed one of my friends. He uh, he blew himself up, and uh, he blew himself up in the truck and hit her truck. And I can remember feeling the the pressure from the bomb. It was so bad. It was so big that when his truck blew her truck up, our trucks felt it. Like we felt the heat. From from that, we felt the heat from the blast. That's how close we were to him, too. He had just passed my truck, and uh, we, I remember thinking, damn, like, he just passed me. And we heard the explosion, all us duck. And when we ducked, we, you know, they said, keep going, keep going. We were like, no, we want to stop and get her. You know, we was to help her. And they said, we can't help her, she's gone. Just keep going. So we kept going, and and uh, that I think that's when I knew this is for real. This ain't no video game. This is not a movie, you know. And I think it made me stronger too. It kind of took the scariness out of me a little bit because now I'm ready to fight. You know what I'm saying? I, I was ready to fight. I was like, okay, that was close. He almost got me, you know, but. You know, it's okay. Do you remember her name? Uh, no, but she was 18. She was about 18 or 19. She was, cause she was in my, um, I believe she's in this yearbook, but I just can't remember her name, but she's in my yearbook cause we all graduated together. It was like everybody who went to the same MOS, you stayed together. So me and her was in the same class I wish I could remember her name, but she, if it, 
I, w I really wish I could remember her name. She was uh, she was a Caucasian, um, really cool, one of my good friends. Um, but I think after that, that's when we all knew it's time to go to fighting and we're going to get revenge. You know, we wanted revenge for her life, you know. Makes you good and mad. Yeah, but it pissed us off. It, even to this day, I think about it, you know. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's when we realized that this thing is real and we need to uh, we need to kill as many of these bastards. Uh, what news were you getting about the progress of the war? Were you hearing much about how things were going? We were watching TV over there because it was kind of hard. They don't have, you know, regular television. Um, but we did have American TV, and so that's how we kept up with everything. Um, we kept up with the war through our generals, um, General Schwarzkopf and Colonel Powell. And let's see, who else was there? Um, I believe those two are the ones that really kept us up to date because they'd come over there, believe it or not. Um, they showed their face. I got a chance to see them, and uh, so they would come check on us, and they and plus our brigade commanders, you know everything was a chain of command. So if something came from America, they didn't really want us to see it on TV because of the news, but they wanted us to take heed from our generals and from our brigade commanders and squad leaders and platoon leaders and stuff like that. So that's how we got our word in from the progress of the war. And then we just pretty much, we, we knew that we had to been winning or at least making a, a difference because Saddam was running and he was hiding in them sand dunes. So we knew we had them, we just couldn't find them, you know. We had him on the run because his people was turning against him. And some of them did, some of them did. They call it uh, ISIS now, but it was called Al-Qaeda back then, I believe it was. But it's the same group. Yeah. Um, so we had to watch out for them, too. And I believe that's who killed one, you know, I said bomb, the uh, truck bomb. Mm -hmm. I believe it was the Al-Qaeda, uh, the word that we got back. It was one of them that had got her. Did you have much contact with the local people in Saudi Arabia? Yes, we did, believe it or not. Um, Tell us about that. We were not supposed to because you didn't know who to trust. But at that point, we just figured, why not get, you know, see who's on our side? So what we did was we went out in the city and we would talk to people who spoke English. Uh, some of the locals spoke really good English. so. We would befriend them, and uh, they would keep us in, uh, you know, intact with what was going on as well. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So the locals, some liked us, some were happy we were there, but some burned our flag and some spit on us and then they want us there. Um, so we got a mixed feeling from both sides, I think. Wow. Yeah, it was. And I, you know, being a female, had to disguise myself as a man because women were not allowed to show their face in public. And being that we were in their country, we had to go by their rules. So it was kind of weird because it's like, well, we're in the military, so why do we have to cover up our faces and, you know, wear these long uh, sleeves and whatnot? So, you know, I, I would... um you know, uh, I had short haircut, so I just throw my hat on and put my hat low and, you know, kind of, it wasn't this big, but I just, you know, go around and put a little deep, you know, bass in my voice. And so I pass as a guy, so it was cool. I go in the, in the city and, you know, they hi, sir. And they never knew I was female, so that was kind of cool, you know. Uh, if they did, they probably would have tried to kill me or rape me because that's what they did to the Americans. Um, I don't know if you remember, the there were two female POWs uh, during my war, and they were both raped, and I believe one was killed. So we understood 
the seriousness of not letting them know that you're a female because they would they would torture you, kill you, and rape you. And uh, yeah, because that happened to a couple of girls from the I think they were Marines, and they were on the front lines that got captured. What's your clearest memory of the time that you were over there? Uh, well, when the scud hit the warehouse, I think that's what really kind of made me realize that, okay, I don't know how long I'm going to last in this war, but to see the Patriot missile hit the scud missile with such force, and when the scud exploded, we were like, yeah, we got it, you know? But th what people didn't realize that there were two sides, or two parts, rather, to the scud missile. So you had your warhead in the front of the missile. You know, you had a scud like this. The warhead's in the front, which is one bomb. You got another bomb in the body part of, this, of the missile. So they destroyed, so the Patriot destroyed the body part of the missile, but not the warhead. So the warhead ended up exploding and, you know, it uh, it fell on the warehouse next to Cobart Towers where I was uh, residing at with my platoon and my unit. And I can remember thinking, oh my God, it felt like an earthquake. And so the gas alarm went off, gas, 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 everybody gas, gas. We uh, put on our mask, we put on our protective gear. We went outside to look to see where it had hit. Cause we knew it hit somewhere. Cause we heard it hit and we felt the earth shake and we smelt the smoke. And when we found out where it hit, it was the warehouse right outside our towers. And the, the unit from Virginia had just been deployed. They just had got there and uh, they perished in, in the flame. And we tried to save them. We, tr we went over there. We took a bus over there to try to save them. And uh, we, the military police held us back because of the, I guess, if they had a touched us or we had a touched them, we would have blew up too. I guess they were still covered in the, what whatever type of uh, explosive, um, I, I want to say gasoline, but it's, I don't know, it's just the most horrible thing you want to see is a person on fire and hair singeing and body parts falling off, but it was, that was rough, to, that was rough to watch. I think uh, somebody on fire running out of a building screaming, help me and I'm feeling helpless. And to this day, I still, I guess, apologize to them, like, I'm so sorry I couldn't help you, but it's, that's rough. I mean, I can't you know, it's one thing when you see someone die, but just to know that you can't help them, I think that's really what the way I took it was, you know, gosh, I hope someone can help me if I'm on fire, you know, but. Other than that, uh, I tell you, it toughens you up. It does. It makes you tough. When you see, when you, especially you can't get that smell out of you, your nose, you can't get that taste out of your throat. You know, it just sticks with you. But I just felt so bad for them because they just got there, you know. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, it was rough. I was even in a, uh, I mean, it was rough on me. I was in a car accident. Uh, coming home from, well, we were at the Dahran Airport. They had turned the airport into a base um, because they kept, you know, uh, Bush, uh, President Bush was deploying more and more soldiers and we had nowhere to keep them. And so they made one of the airports in Dahran a base. And on the way home, uh, I lost control of the car. I think my steering column popped or something. 
And uh, till this day, I still think it was sabotage, you know, because um, no, because when the MPs found me, they thought I was dead, and so they had, you know, courted me off dead, you know. And uh, when they got me to the hospital, I came too, and I didn't know what happened. All I remembered is I, my steering column broke. It started spinning. My car went to spinning 360 degrees, and I hit a concrete pole, and and I passed out after that. So, uh, you know, of course, the MPs took pictures of everything and the accident scene, and and when they showed it to me, I should not even be alive. The car was wrapped around the pole. It was by the grace of God, for real, that I survived that. And you were by yourself? I was with a friend, another soldier, and he survived as well. He survived as well. We we came out with just, I had glass in my eyes, so my eyes were cut, my face was cut, his face was cut, our, our bodies, and the, I think my back of my head had scraped against the pole, so it didn't hit. Like if I had hit it, it would have busted my head open. But I had a knot, so I guess I did get hit in the back of the head. And uh, that's why the MP said they thought I was dead. And so when I came to and I realized what happened, I was like, oh my God, I've just been in a terrible car accident. And uh, they showed me the pictures, and all I could say was just, Lord, thank you, because I would have been, you know, I would have been dead. Um, so how and, long were you out? How Did you, did they take you off duty for a while? You were yes, out? they took me off duty. Uh, I was there for, what, 10, 11 months, so they took me off duty for about a month. You know, my neck was messed up. And uh, when they took me off duty, you know, I just spent time relaxing in the rear and just, you know, doing little odds and ends supply stuff. You know, uh, T rats, C rations, the MREs, you know, sort of in the, like that. I went, I didn't go uh, to the front as much as, um, you know, uh, I didn't uh, travel that much to the front gotcha. after that. Um, after the accident, it started, like the war started kind of slowing down. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a short war, by the way. Mm -hmm. It didn't last very long because we thought it was going to be another Vietnam War. We, we thought, oh, God, we're, we're looking at another seven years. But uh, it only lasted maybe, what, a year or two? Not even two years, probably just a year, if that. As, as soon as it happened, it was done, you know, because they found him so fast. Um, his own, and how we found him, his own people turned him in, you know, kind of gave him a, gave him away. And we found him in the uh, sand dune. They had built a tunnel. I don't see how, how can you build a tunnel in a sand, in a sand dune? That's just, wow. <laughs> but he was in there. He was right under them sand dunes. And, what do you remember about um, communicating with your family? You they would give us, um, every weekend, uh, they had telephones. So like I said, even though we were in a different country, they had sort of modernized it. Uh, they would give us time to call home Great. to our families and spouses if you were married or whatever. And um, so every chance I got, you can best believe every chance I got, I took it. And I got on that phone and let my parents, you know, Mom, I'm alive, I'm doing good. You know, I didn't tell them about the accident till I got back to America because I didn't want her to, you know, I didn't want Mom to be worried. You know, she would have had, oh my God, she probably would have came over there to Saudi Arabia <laughs> if she knew that I had gotten the car accident, almost got killed. So, uh, Every chance I get, got that, you know, to use the telephone or to write, we did a lot of mail. So I did get letters and I did write a lot of letters. Um, and on the flip side of the war, believe it or not, that we, we had parties, like we had our own, 
you know, spade games and tunk games, uh, gin rummy. Uh, what's what's another one? Bizwiz, like all the card games. Even uh, even what's it? Uh, Uno. <laughs> like some people had their friends to send a care package, and we got Uno cards. Uh, so it was it it was fun. Like on the downside of it, you know, we were able to have a party and get together with different units and. I got to meet a lot of people from California and Seattle, Washington, uh, D.C., uh, New York, um, everywhere, you know. And so I thought that was kind of fun because I was young and I'm in the military. I'm, I'm going to make a 20-year career. At least that's what I thought, make a 20-year career. And, uh, you know, I'm going to meet people and go see the world and everything you see on the commercials. Remember that B? All that you can be. And they got this big old picture of the helicopter and the thing. And so that's what I wanted. You know, I was like, but this ain't nothing like this. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, what I done got myself into? So, uh, but yeah, it was fun. We had a place called Oasis where you could play basketball and you could swim. We had a swimming pool. Uh, we even had a bar. Like, you can go get you a nice drink of vodka or something and a cold beer. Uh, <laughs> you know, stuff, I, I guess stuff you didn't see on the news. Because um, every time I looked at the news, it was always stuff blowing up or people dying or kids blowed up and bleeding all over the place. And, you know, and I'm thinking, that ain't what's really happening over here. It, I mean, it does happen, but... You know, we're traveling, we're going to the stores, we're buying jewelry, we're having fun. We're trying to make the best out of a bad situation because people were killing themselves. You had friendly fire. You had uh, people going AWOL, which I didn't understand that because you're in a different country, but like, why would you go over here and then want to go AWOL, right? So, yeah. but. Uh, it was a lot of experiences. I mean, I got to travel through the country, actually, you know, especially after I got hurt. I really couldn't drive my truck. And um, so I was pretty much driving the Humvees at that point since I couldn't drive the big trucks. Gotcha. And uh, one, oh, one good thing I forgot to say about during uh, when we were in King Khalid's military city area is uh, do you remember when Saddam uh, ordered his troops to blow up the oil fields? Yes. Well, our mission was to go through that. And I, I tell you, it looked like doomsday. It, it could be 7 o'clock in the morning and it's pitch dark. And all you see is oil burning, clouds of oil just everywhere. So it was hard for us to drive our trucks because the oil was getting in our engines, the oil, believe it or not, in our engines coming through and um, the windshield was just covered in oil. So our windshield wipers wouldn't work that good, you know, because they're designed for rain and not oil. So you can figure us, got the windshield wipers going, we're looking out the window, we got our windows down. So now we're getting hit in the face with all this oil and some people um, some people's health issues went down because of that, uh, including mine. Um, I ended up having black lungs behind inhaling all that oil. Uh, I think I was diagnosed 20 years ago, but I'm okay now. And, you know, it's, it wasn't as bad as they thought, but I had little spots of oil in my lungs. And uh, I, couldn't, I, I just couldn't believe we even made it through all of that, that smog. Um, it looked, like I said, it looked like hell, it looked like doomsday. Uh, sh you had fire shooting maybe 800 feet in the air. I mean, at least a hundred of them that I saw. Cause you know, desert is just like a horizon in the ocean. There's nothing behind it. It's just land. So for, as far as I could see, all you see is this metal frame with fire just splurting everywhere. 
And uh, we had to drive through it. And, uh, you know, we had to drive through, we had to drive back. And that was kind of hard on me because I knew it, I didn't want to be inhaling that, that oil. People were coughing up oil. I mean, it was terrible. It was almost as if they just took a, a bottle of oil and just threw it in our face. So your nose had it, you know, you blow your nose and it's black, you know. Um, and there was also a convoy that got blown up. We had to drive through. Um, they used a smart bomb, I believe it was, in one of those convoys where they had Saddam, but he got away. That's when they first tried to attack him in the con, because they were moving Saddam to a different place. And the intelligence got back that he was in that convoy. They just didn't know which one. So they blew up the whole thing. So I thought it was kind of cool to drive by and see all these burn. You know, I'm like, wow, they just blew. You know, I'm a kid, so I don't know any better. You know, I'm like, wow, we riding through this thing. Let's stop and get some artifacts. You know, let's stop and get some souvenirs. So we stopped our trucks. <laughs> We stopped our trucks and jumped out and got souvenirs. Okay. <laughs> I know. Like, why would anybody want to go and take a picture around a dead person, right? I don't know. But we didn't care. We just. Yeah, your kids. Right? We, right. We just saw something blowed up and we just wanted to go over there and take a picture with it, you know? <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe we did that. But, uh, but yeah, because it was the actual convoy. Like, you can research it and see it in the book. But we drove through it after it happened. So, you know, it was still smoldering. And I think the grossest thing, though, was seeing people cut in half or where they blew up in half. That was, yeah, if you don't have a strong stomach, you don't want to see that, yeah. you know. But uh, we were gung-ho, and we wanted to see it, and we went over there and saw it. And I think, but, you know, I think that was just our way of uh, getting over the hurt of one of our soldiers, you know, paying the ultimate price. Uh, sort of our get back, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. that's what you get, you know, but really, to be honest, I just wish it could be peace in the world. This is really that's all we need is peace in this world. We, you know, is the history of America in any country, anywhere in the world, is always a war somewhere. And it's like, when do when can we stop that? You know, that that I think that's what uh, I think that's what we really should be focused on. We could still have our military, but let's just try to keep the peace. You know. We don't have to go around killing everybody all the time, but I tell you what, if it's time to go to war, I'm volunteering, I'm going. You know, at least that's what it did. When you were sent to Saudi Arabia, did you know how long you'd be there or was it kind of an open-ended order as you were there? It was an open-ended order. Okay. They told us to stay as long as we're told to stay and if you got hurt, you know, they'd ship you back right. to Germany and then so Germany was like a, if you got hurt, they send you to Germany to the doctor and then they send you home, sort of medical leave. Right. But um, yeah, we, it, it was, I don't know. It, when I think about it, you know, it was, um, I probably would have rather went to Germany. <laughs> but. Uh, well, tell us about how you found out when it was time to go home. How, how, did, how did things wind down for you? Okay. After the accident that I told you about me um, being in the car accident, um, I put in a request. I said, I was like, hey, look, you know, uh, I'm a little, a little overwhelmed right now. You know, I just, because I ended up losing uh, special squires Who's, who passed away. He was a, a telecommunications uh, soldier and he was in my unit and he had a heart attack. But we think it was uh, something he ate.
because we would eat their food. Um, we, we, I don't, we, you know, we don't know exactly what it was, but they just said he had a heart attack. So after he passed away, that really hurt me because we were in the desert together. We were in the unit together and he had told me, you know, he had kids and he was young and he didn't want to die. You know, he didn't want to die. And so when he died, it was like, oh my God, no. Out of all people to go, I didn't think it would be him, you know. And I think it was that point that I realized I better get the hell out of here before I die. And so I put my request in to uh, leave. But I wasn't leaving the military. I didn't want to leave out of the army. I just wanted to go somewhere else. Like, just change my orders to another place. And um, so when that didn't happen, they said, no, we're going to keep you here. I said, well, you know what? I just asked for um, a medical discharge. Like, hey, I'm hurt. I can't drive my truck. I don't know how long it's going to take to heal. Um, the war started kind of, like I said, dwindling down. And... I felt like, you know, hey, I, I, don't, I don't lost two friends. I don't got in a car accident. I um, been shot at, you know, almost blowed up. You know, it was just all those things. And I wanted to go home. And I was, you know, I didn't want to die and I wanted to go home. And I was like, you know, uh, I talked to my E6 who was over me, uh, E6 sergeant. And uh, he talked to, you know, some people and so, you know, they had to let me talk to the chaplain. I think that's when my PTSD, it, I didn't know it was PTSD then, but I think that's when I started having the symptoms and going through the uh, withdrawals of PTSD and all that stuff is when I talked to the chaplain overseas and told him what I thought and how I was thinking. And, and so he put in a word, they did an x-ray, you know, they did physical and, uh, so I said, you know, I think I want to, I, I need to go. I need to go back to America. And they gave me an honorable discharge to come home so I don't have to fight anymore. Um, I could have, I guess, stayed in after that, but I just didn't want to fight no more wars. And I, I knew we'd probably end up in another war sooner or later, which it did. We ended up in the second desert storm, then Afghanistan then Iraqi freedom. So I just wasn't ready to mentally, you know, uh, handle that. After what I saw, after what I've been through, uh, uh, the experience itself was, uh, it was a great experience, I guess, because it is what I wanted. I wanted to be in the military. And this, you know, when they tell you when you uh, swear in, they, that's why you swear in twice, because they tell you if you're not sure, then you have a chance to get out. But once you swear in twice, you got to go. So I had a commitment. So I had to make sure that I held my end of the bargain, did my job, you know, did what I was told to do, did my, handled my mission. And once that was over, then I was ready to leave, you know, once, especially after I got hurt because I couldn't function right, you know. And, uh, and so I didn't want to get, uh, keep getting put to different units like I was doing because remember when I got in, I never got assigned a unit. So I was just with this unit for a minute, then they switched me, you know, to another unit for a minute. So I ended up with two units. I was in um, 471st Trans and uh, I think 1238 Trans from Indiana and the other was from Seattle, Washington, I believe it was. So were you regular army assigned yes. to, were these National Guard units or were they? They were National they Guard were National unit Guard or units. reserve units. Gotcha. Yes, okay. so I didn't even get to my regular army unit. Yeah. That's what I, cause I was like, wow. I didn't even get to my regular army unit. I don't even know who my unit is. Yeah. I just was told, hey, you're going over here, and you, once you get there, you'll be assigned 
to 471st. When I got there, boom, 471st came and got me, and that's who my unit was. Okay. And even though they were a National Guard or Reserve unit, it didn't really matter because of wartime. So I guess all that reserve stuff goes out the door once you're in a war, you know, because whoever you're assigned to, that's who you got to go with. Right. But. Uh, well, tell us about coming home. What was that experience like? Coming home was rough, uh, rough ride on the airplane. Uh, because like I said, we were told, you know, it still wasn't safe, airspace. Uh, they would hide their um, artillery in the sand dunes, so you never really knew where this, uh, what the fire would be coming from, but luckily we weren't fired upon. Uh, but we did have a rough ride back, meaning turbulence, um, you know, just air, the, the way planes do mm -hmm. with, you know, the bumpy ride. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was another C-130, so that's why I say it was kind of bumpy ride. Because if you know, those are really huge planes and, you know, it's, it's a lot to try to get one of those big old things up in the air. For real. They're, they're big birds. But the ride, the trip home was good. Um, I believe we prayed the whole way home. Uh, I believe I was jumping for joy and I slept. <laughs> I think I finally got a good night rest, finally, because I didn't get no sleep pretty much over in Saudi Arabia. Not that I remember. I mean, we slept a couple of hours, then you had guard duty. Yeah. So I spent most of my days and nights on guard duty. And so I was very happy to get some good sleep once I got on that plane home. And uh, once we got home, we were uh, greeted with people that I didn't even know. Uh, I got home, I think they took me to Dover, Delaware. And from Dover, Delaware, they shipped me to Fort Dix, New Jersey, which is closed now, but I think they still use it for National Guard or something. But Fort Dix, uh, that's where they out process and uh, I signed my papers and they gave me an option of uh, you know coming back in if I wanted to because I think I think the age limit is 36 or something like that where you could be 36 years old you could still be in basic training so I was like well I'll see how you know, life treats me and then, but I, I never ended up going back to the military. I uh, just stayed retired. Uh, I was traumatized, okay, I was just 19. Well, I turned 20 over there, by the way. I turned, I had a birthday, January 22nd, 1991 was my birthday, 20 years old in Saudi Arabia, so, and yes, we did have a birthday party for me <laughs> over there uh, <laughs> with our rifles and stuff, Woo! shooting everywhere, you know. But, uh, <laughs> um, so did you go back to school? Um, no, I haven't gone back to school yet. I do plan on going back to school. Um, I'm trying to get the post 9-11 GI Bill that they have now for the veterans such as myself who's been out. Um, I waited too late. They said it's 10 year statute limitations. Okay. Uh, but I am eligible since I'm service connected that I'm still eligible to get education benefits. Okay. So it's probably not called the GI Bill but yeah. vocational benefits or something. But yes ma'am I do plan on going back to school to finish my degree. Um, in a way, I do wish I had stayed in the Army uh, because that's what I wanted, a 20-year 20 uh, 20-year uh, service. But uh, like I said, if they ever needed, you know, uh, if, if something happens, um, I'm always willing to fight. So... Uh, well, let me ask you one thing. Um, you mentioned that women, it was a little different back in 1990, um, going into the military as a woman, and certainly as a woman of color. Did you 
find, did you have any, any experience with any kind of discrimination or prejudice based on either your gender or your? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, was it okay to bring that up? Absolutely. Um, you know, the world we live in, we have hate. Uh, yes, we may have been called the N-word, you know, but we just, psh, just brush that off. Um, being, at, especially at Fort Jackson, uh, they didn't really want the women there, and it didn't matter what color you were. They didn't really want women there, period. So they made it extra hard for us to be extra hard. Um, like I say, we may have been, and it probably wasn't as discriminative as hitting us or anything, but as far as the workout or the training or say for instance, like drill sergeant might tell someone, hey, I want you to do this, but because of my color, he's going to tell me I can't do it. But in actuality, I should still be able to do it. You see what I'm saying? So it wasn't as bad as I guess the 60s or the 70s as like my father and them came up in. Cause I, I know some guys from Vietnam told me some really hurtful stories about being in Vietnam and the white sergeant might say, you know, the N word or, or like screw him or, you know, and they're all dying together, you know what I'm saying, in a time like that. So, yeah, we dealt with that, too. But I think now it's a little more lenient than it was for us. Because, like I said, it really wasn't, I don't think, color involved. It was, it was uh, more of uh, gender. gender. And the males, it was male-dominated at Fort Jackson. And so I don't think they were, they were ready for women there yet. And when I got there, they had just turned it co-ed. So I kind of got the end of the blunt force, you know, as far as that. But as um, we graduated, you know, they didn't discriminate that. Um, they let us graduate and, you know, but other than name calling, you know, the basic stuff like when you're in school and you get name called. Um, we dealt with it, you know, we just brushed it off. Like I said, we might have cursed them out back under our breaths, you know, <laughs> so, it was, so we didn't get in any trouble. But, <laughs> you know, we couldn't say it to the sergeant's face, but, uh, you know, we might have behind his back kind of, oh, you mother, you know. But uh, other than that, we, I guess we didn't really care because we felt, hey, we're fighting for our country and it shouldn't matter what color and race and gender and stuff, even though it was tough, just like the first black unit that fought in the Civil War. You know, um, they took, I think, the really bad blunt of it. And so if they could do it and if they could overcome it, then hey, we felt like we could too. And we didn't let that distract us or we didn't let that determine and defy our, you know, being, because I'm not prejudiced, We're, we weren't prejudiced, you know, some of my best friends were white. And so we didn't care about all that color stuff. We just, we wanted to learn how to fight in a, you know, wartime situation. We want to know how to protect ourselves and families and our country. Our thing was patriotism. We didn't care about, you know, your discrimination. You know, if you hated us, fine. You know, we made it our business to, you know, say hello to you. If we knew you didn't like us, we'd speak to you. You know, that type of stuff. You know, we kill you with kindness to get back at him, I guess you could say. Instead of sit there and mope and grope and feel bad and, oh, you can't talk to me. You know, some people, you know, hey, who, you can't talk to me like that. You know, And then they get in trouble, you know, for talking back. So we just learn to just not say nothing. If they screamed at us, you know, they'd be in our face spitting and carrying on and hollering and screaming and spitting and we just had to stand there and take it. You know what I'm saying? We couldn't do nothing. We just, and then once he left, then we'll take our clothes and wipe our mouth. You know, <laughs> it was rough, but we, we got through it. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, it didn't make us that way. It didn't make us hate anybody. And then, 
you know, whatever they were trying to uh, uh, teach, it, it didn't rub off on us because our minds were on something totally different. You know, maybe that's the way they came up in the military back in those days. And the same drill sergeants from then were the same drill sergeants for us. So that, you know, that's the way we took it. Cause we had black drill sergeants. We had women drill sergeants. We, we had um, all different type of race of drill sergeants, you know, and I thought the black ones were the roughest on us than the white ones were because they expected more out of us because they knew what we were facing and the you know especially race at that time because you figure 1990 uh, we were just coming up out of uh, the 70s with that you know when when Jimmy Carter was president I think is when as far as I can remember when Jimmy Carter was president and he was for the blacks and I remember him bringing, I think he kind of like brought us all together a little bit when he, uh, cause uh, the war had just stopped from Vietnam, right? And then he became president and then he tried to s sort of combine all of us together. And uh, I believe, I think that worked, you know? It just took time for those individuals who were still in that hate mode to get out of it, I think. You know, so other than that, we had a great basic training. You know, other than that, it was great. Did you feel as a black woman that you were given all the opportunities for advancement and for, did you feel any discrimination in terms of how far you could go with your career or the assignments that you were given as compared with white? I think we were given the tougher, you know, like I say, it was tough on us, mm -hmm. um, but it made us better. And I was um, like, yes, your question, yes and yes. Uh, if you were white, you know, you were pretty much going to pass every class and you, without incident, or you could do what you want or ask questions or anything like that. But with the, you know, with the blacks at that time at Fort Jackson, we had to go through chain of command. You know, we just couldn't talk to the big boss. You know, some you know, little stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it really wasn't as big as uh, as maybe as when you grew up with the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King. It it probably wasn't that bad, but we still had a little of that to deal with. So gotcha. yeah. Gotcha. So it it wasn't even. So say like if my counterpart would get something. I probably couldn't get the same thing. I would have to maybe pull some strings in order to get it. Or work a little or harder. Or work harder. Like I said, I, I swear, I swear, I'm not gonna swear to the almighty, but I know I'm hit expert. And that was one of the things I felt discriminate, like, I bet you if I was white, I would've gave me expert, you know? So, yeah, but that's the only thing, a little stuff like that, it wasn't, um, it had nothing to do with it, because if you graduated, if you passed your test, if you, you know, did everything right, you graduated. It didn't matter what color you were, because a lot of whites didn't graduate either, you know, right. on both sides, black and white. Right. Um, wasn't, you know, like I said, probably 80% of us out of 100, you know, okay. out of those, yeah. Was well, there anything you'd like to tell us about your post-military, what you're doing now, family, any? Um, okay, um, what I'm doing now is, uh, well, I moved, I'm originally from Orlando, Florida, so I moved from Orlando here, and uh, I'm trying to go back to school, like I said, for business. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to be in the music business again. I used to be uh, a music um, rap artist, but then... I decided to just go into the R&B and other stuff because I didn't want to limit myself to just one genre of music. So I, I moved to Atlanta to go back to school to get a degree in uh, music business. And um, hopefully I can get that done within the next year or two because uh, I want to start my own business. I want to be an entrepreneur. And that was my thing. Um, I was in Orlando and I admit I'm not a saint. I messed up, I screwed up, 
uh, got in a lot of trouble, and so I decided to change my life. And I moved here, and I decided to make something better of myself and, uh, you know, make my mother proud of me. Um, because she's such, I haven't mentioned her a lot, but I'll say one thing about my mom. She was in the civil rights movement. Um, she went to uh, South Carolina State College at the time, and Martin Luther King had done a speech in Orangeburg, South Carolina at the school. Well, shortly after that, the, I believe, Ku Klux Klan uh, went to the school and, you know, they rioted and killed two of the students. And my mom was at that rally, so she's lucky she wasn't killed at that rally as well. So that's a little history right there about the civil rights that my mother was actually in. And she was uh, in the march and as well as the 100 women, a million women march. I don't know if you remember back in 2007, she was actually in that too. So my mother has been an advocate of civil rights for years since the 60s. And she told me about that incident after Martin Luther King came to her school. And uh, so she's a freedom fighter. And so I think that's what she instilled that in me is to not be prejudiced and you know, to fight for equality on, on all levels, you know. And I always looked up to her for that because, I mean, that had to been very brave to stand there and see what was going on and because those were her friends who died. So, you know, I could imagine what was going through my mother's mind. So I think that's where I got all that toughness was actually, you know, being from my mom growing up in that era. And my grandmother, of course, you know, being uh, a slave. And, you know, I come from a family of uh, who used to be slaves. So um, Gordon, my last name is actually the plantation owner's last name. So that's how we got our, our Gordon name. Mm -hmm. uh, but my mother's last name was Butler. So um, my well, great, my mother's mother worked, you know, for the the missus, and mm -hmm. so you know our, our family has a history of that. And uh, so I think growing up, I just didn't want to grow up that way. You know, I just figured, okay, well, here's the time for us to try to make a change in the world. You know, it has to start somewhere. And uh, so I think if it wasn't for my mom really instilling those values in me at an early age and explaining to me about Martin Luther King and everything else about you know race discrimination and whatnot, because I was told that blacks weren't even, even in the 80s and 90s, like they still didn't really want us in there. You know what I'm saying? Like even in Vietnam, they didn't want us in there. And uh, so I just felt honored to even be chosen to be in it at that time, even in 90 because I knew that it was it was gonna be hard. A lot of us didn't make it because we either quit or uh, they, you know, failed the course. Because if you fail the course, you get kicked out. And you, then you get kicked out with a, a dishonorable discharge. So I knew I couldn't disgrace, I didn't want to be disgraced like that. Uh, I did everything in my power to make it through those, those courses and like I say, learning from my parents and especially my mom, being that she was right alongside Martin Luther King and them, I, I just figured it was the the least I could do is to try to fight for the country. You know what I'm saying? Because you know a lot of people are like you're black. Why are you going to the military? The military is not a place. I'm sure you've heard this. Uh, military is not a place for black people. Well, that's just a stereotype. Okay, if you want to go and you're black, go. And I tell that to people now, if you're young and you're black and you want to go, go. Just because whoever, I don't care who's the president, because I ain't going to say no names. I'm not political. I'm not, I'm a Democrat. Okay, that's, I, I vote Democrat. So all I'm saying is whoever the president is, it doesn't matter. If you want to go in the military, go. Because you're, you're not just fighting. It ain't even about the president. You're fighting for yourself. 
And at least that's what I was thinking back then. I didn't, I was like, who is President Bush? We didn't even know who he was. We just knew he was a chain of command, you know? Because all we knew is what we learned in Fort Jackson and uh, everything that they taught us to go fight in a war. So we didn't even know what we was fighting for. Do you even know what we was fighting for? I, to this day, I heard it was for the oil. Now, I could be wrong, but fighting for the oil seems like a good reason. But to this day, I don't know why Desert Storm even happened other than Saddam was, uh, you know, killing all of his people up and stuff like that. So maybe, you know, we go in there and try to help him, uh, help the people. But uh, I, I, I just hope that whoever comes after me, you know, and, and you fight, just do it from here because you got to do it from your heart. Because if you don't, you're, you're going to die or you're going to fail or you're going to get hurt. Or you gonna, if it ain't in your heart, don't do it. That's all I can say. Because, you know, when they ask me why did I join, because I'm gung-ho and I'm ready to fight. And that's just the way I was. And that, you know, really, that's why I joined. I was, in the, I was uh, going to college and I quit college to go to the military, so. Well, Tracy, um. I think you're a trailblazer. And I think, <laughs> Thank I think you. That uh, young women watching this interview are going to see that and be inspired by your example. Um, yep. I'm proud of you. I I love love that. Mom gave it to me, I think, for Christmas or my birthday, but she gave me this book, and it's so interesting because uh. it shows everything in it, the history. Army proud. Army proud. It shows the history of everything. And before we go, a, I yeah, want to show. you got a couple of other things yep. to Make sure you show everything oh, you broke. This is my my rank. I was an E2. Well, yeah, E2. Awesome. Um, but actually, it's, I believe it's the PFC. But I made PFC, but it's still E2 on my record. But I um, was, before I got out, I was headed toward the PFC. And then this hat is the actual <laughs> hat. This is an artifact, everybody. <laughs> but this hat here has been through the actual war. And as you can see, it says there are two patches. There's one that says mission accomplished, and the other patch is just the regular Saudi Arabian patch. And the reason this is such, this is, a, um, I call it an artifact, is because when I got home from Desert Storm, my dad, God bless his soul, he passed away in 1996, but he wore this hat every single day. My, I think my mom and my brother and sister told me that he fished, his, this was his fishing hat <laughs> that he loved to go fishing in to remind him of me and to keep me close to him. And I found it after he passed away. I went home and I found it. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna keep it and I'm gonna preserve it and probably frame it because it means, it really, it, it, this means something to me, you know, in a lot of words. Uh, this hat been through a lot. <laughs> That's I mean, awesome. it's been I through, and know. it says Iraq, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia, and I got to uh, go to all three countries, Iraq, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia, so that was cool. I thought, yeah, that was really cool. And one more I have. Um, a picture of me while we were doing our training where it says Big Trey. <laughs> that was my nickname. I was Big Trey, first squad leader. Charlie 328 Trans, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. <laughs> and that's me with my M16 and my bayonet. And that's me and my drill sergeant is looking at me because she just got through fussing at me, I think. And the, I think the camera or something was looking and I said something. She was like, and then she looked. So I had to straighten up then. I couldn't talk no more. But, uh. All right.
<laughs> it was nice. My experience in the military was very, 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 very nice. Um, I'm glad I did go to the Army. Uh, I'd do it all again. Um, I don't need a president to draft me. I'm already gung-ho. I'm ready for it. Uh, if he does need me, all you got to do is call me. And uh, some people call me crazy, but you know, hey, you got to be crazy if you're going to be a soldier. Because you're going to see and you're going to do a lot of stuff that, uh, that you've probably never done in your life. So, you know, huh. Well, thank you for coming in. Ed, do you have any questions? No. Uh, you good? The reason, the reason we had Gulf Storm, Desert Storm 1, was the invasion of Kuwait. Right. Okay, that's what it was. Kind of the combination of an international bully and then the International oil. bully and invasion of Kuwait. Okay. Yeah, and the oil. And the oil. So the oil did have something oh, I think to do with does. it. Okay. Because yeah. that's what we were thinking. We were like, are we fighting for oil or are we fighting for... It was only part of it, though. I think he, you know, he, we, like you said, he needed to be stopped. He needed to be stopped so. because he was, when, when we saw, I think what did it for us is when they showed us a picture, because, you know, they debrief you mm -hmm. uh, before you go, and they showed us the pictures. Yeah. And I think what really got to us were the children... And the the way the gas was, um, it's a gas. I don't know what the name of it is, but it eats you from the inside out. And I wish I could think of the name of it, but we called it the, it's some type of bacteria or nerve agent that eats you from the inside out. And we just couldn't believe he would actually do that to his people or to the kids. And so that's what, you know, we were like, yeah, let's go stop them. Let's get them. Well, Tracy, thank you. Thank you for your service, and thank you for thank this you. interview. Thank you for the interview. We appreciate it. <laughs>